Now that the state Supreme Court has ruled New Jersey municipalities do have an obligation to provide affordable housing, townships face two choices. One is to settle, the other to sue. Several hundred have chosen the latter. That's drawn conflicting solutions from stakeholders on all sides of the political spectrum. Brianna Venosi reports on fulfilling the requirement for those still chasing the dream. If you ask half a dozen different stakeholders how New Jersey should implement affordable housing, you're probably going to get a half a dozen different answers. Fortunately, there is one area where everyone seems to be on the same page. Every single person I've spoken to agrees that there is a housing affordability issue in the state. And we need to work together to come up with creative ways to address that. Bergen County Assemblywoman Holly Shapizzi's district is home to dozens of municipalities fighting the Mount Laurel Supreme Court ruling. And she's taken the lead in the legislature, drafting a plan to satisfy affordable housing requirements while also providing towns with options that work for them, rather than ones handed down by trial judges. One of my first bills was, let's take a breather. Let's sit down, let's work together across the aisle and come up with a better solution. Let's do our job the way that the Supreme Court just told us to. Immediately, I started getting attacked as racist and xenophobia. That's partly because the divide over affordable housing regulations has deeply rooted racial tensions, drawn from decades-long narratives about violence and crime following low-income, mainly minority residents. It's the not-in-my-backyard attitude. The delicate nature of it all has caused many lawmakers to stay out of the debate entirely. We need to increase the cap to allow more senior housing to be viewed as eligible as well as special needs. We need to start looking at maybe innovative things of doing public-private partnerships. We have 40,000 foreclosed homes in this pro that are sitting vacant right now in the state. Shapizi is proposing a statewide solution, one that would put more affordable housing in towns where the infrastructure to accommodate more residents is already in place. But that's exactly the kind of thinking that Fair Share Housing Center opposes. Peter O'Connor founded the organization. He's one of the attorneys from the original Mount Laurel case. He says that would keep low-income residents in already densely populated urban areas. The major objective when we started was to give people in communities like Camden a choice of whether to stay in Camden or to live in a more economically and racially balanced community. The Supreme Court has backed that objective or goal and the municipal governments have, along with the state's lack of funding, have retarded or slowed that growth. He believes the courts need to be involved as a neutral arbitrator. This is such a political issue that basically the towns would opt for the lowest possible formula, the lowest figures, and we as advocates would follow the COA standards and come up with, with higher numbers. Since December 2009, the state of New Jersey has lost every single battle. The housing advocates have won every battle. What does that tell you? Oh, that would tell you that the state's not doing it right. It's been easy for all parties to point fingers at the Council on Affordable Housing, or COA. After all, the agency did fail to come up with the rules and obligations for towns to follow. So we turned to Lori Griffa, former Department of Community Affairs Commissioner, responsible for the agency for two years. Regardless of whether you were a Democrat or Republican, you were from a big town or a little town, you are from the north or the south, you were from the suburban or the rural, there were people in, of every one of those uh, communities who had something negative to say about the program. So that was really the challenge. Griffa says COA couldn't come up with an alternate plan to Mount Laurel, one that could survive court challenges. That was made worse by legislative inaction. But even though COA failed, she tells us the state's involvement keeps towns from skirting their obligations. There have been towns who've been sitting on the sidelines with their hands on their pockets who were basically deciding they weren't going to do anything until the court spoke. And the failure to do anything over a 15-year period has actually created a number that is pretty big. But that was a choice. Nobody credibly questions the need. The question becomes, how does it, how should it be calculated? 
in view of the, the uh, practical realities and the limitations that the legislature established in the Fair Housing Act. Jeffrey Seranian represents 60 municipalities fighting the Supreme Court ruling. He says the towns are facing a costly burden. According to Fair Share Housing's estimates, the state needs to build at least another 200,000 units, and small municipalities aren't equipped to handle the services that come with it. So far, roughly 140 out of the 350 towns bringing litigation have settled on their numbers. There's a big myth. And the myth is that the bigger the numbers, the more affordable housing you're going to have. That's not true. What's going to drive the production of affordable housing in this state is the market for market housing so that the market housing can uh, generate the revenue to subsidize the affordable units in traditional inclusionary development where 20 percent of the units are affordable. The fact of the matter is if towns are committed to providing affordable housing, those towns tend to find a way to get it done. But just how are they getting it done? In part three, we'll take you to neighborhoods where affordable housing development is being embraced and where it's being challenged. For NJTV News, I'm Brianna Venosi.